For the first time, we're hearing from the Alabama man who found his wife dead and two young children brutally murdered in their family home. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Sierra Gillespie. We're taking a closer look at this heartbreaking story where three lives were tragically cut short. In Sems, Alabama, just outside of Mobile, investigators say Derek Johnson entered the home on September 28th to find his wife, 37-year-old Nancy Johnson, dead. He also discovered his children, five-year-old Mia and two-year-old Jacob, murdered. At first, officials did not release how Nancy or the children were killed, only saying they weren't shot. The local sheriff told TV stations, quote, it was more horrific than that. But a few days later, investigators said Nancy allegedly drowned both her children and slashed her daughter's throat before strangling herself. We're joined now by Derek Johnson, the husband and father who found the disturbing crime scene. And Derek, thank you so much for joining us today. And we're sorry it's under such tragic circumstances. Thank you for having me. So let's start really with the basics. How are you holding up right now? That's, that's, that's a tough question, but I'm doing better than I was the day it happened. I will say that. And I want viewers to know it was actually you who reached out to Law and Crime Network for this interview. So why do you want to tell your side of the story now? I think there's a lot more to be said that what led up to this. Um, obviously, it's value. Everyone got the raw facts of what happened. And I think there's a lot more to be learned on the mental health side. and. I'm still grappling with it because I never could ever do like this. And even her family's still not believing that she would truly have done something like this. We're just, I'm trying to back up and take a look at what went wrong, but it's really hard to see what happened. Yeah. And I, I mean, I know this is difficult, but can you take me back to last week, walking into that home? What do you remember? So... So I, I'll back up just a hair before that. I arrived Wednesday at 4.30 to the house with the RV and was driving from Washington State as ordered by the judge. And that day, the van was in the driveway. Um, all the lights were off. Uh, I, I assumed she had gone somewhere with, the, with a friend or something and she would be dropped off later. Um, I just maintained the house and acted as everything was normal. but. When I got up the next evening, the next day on Thursday, um, I noticed there was no sounds, there was no, no movement. Was, all the blinds closed. You know, it was very dark. There was only one light on in the master bedroom, and I had a feeling that I needed to, I needed to get into the house, and so I ended up uh, drilling out the door lock, French doors in the back, and. Uh, as I did that, the deadbolt fell to the floor and made a pretty loud sound. And I opened the door after that and noticed my kids were taking naps on, on, the, on the L-shaped sectional we have. And um, I, I saw my friend, but... I didn't feel them. I don't, I don't know how, how else to say that. They were there, but I did not feel them. And I went over to my son and put my hand on his back to wake him up. And he was just stiff. And then I saw foam coming out of his mouth and nose. And he had discolorations on his face. And I started panicking. And then I went over to my daughter and she had the same thing. And then I started wondering where their mom was. And immediately I went to the master bathroom. And when I looked in the master bathroom, there was a bathtub full of water and blood 
And I, I, I couldn't handle processing why that was there other than that shouldn't be there. And then I proceeded to turn the closets towards the master and saw Nancy in a sitting collapse position and there was blood on the floor. And after that, I really don't remember much other than went to call 911. And that's, that's all I remember. Yeah, I'm sure it was a very traumatic and intense moment. You were speaking about what led up to that. So if we kind of turn the clock back a bit leading up to this terrible tragedy. So it happened in Alabama, but your family is from Washington State and Utah. So can you kind of explain that background to me? So we originally lived in Washington, Washington State, and um, we decided to move down here after housing prices were going way up. Affordability was not happening. And so we decided to move down here a year and a half ago. And she has two sisters that are in Utah. Uh, we never lived there. Uh, she did at some point before the time I met her. Um, but that's, uh, that's kind of the history of where we originally came from. And at the time of this, I believe it was you and Nancy were estranged that you'd actually filed for divorce. Can you explain that a bit? So this is, this is where it gets interesting. So around Christmas, she expressed she wanted a divorce, but would not tell me the reasons why. And she struggled to find reasons on the divorce documents to state why she wanted a divorce other than emotional differences. And she started getting irrational with the children around April, saying that I needed to give up all my parental rights. Uh, the children were to be in 100% of her custody. I would only see them two hours a day when at her convenience. The first initial draft of uh, the divorce that she wrote was completely, I had zero rights, zero anything. And when I left at the end of April, that's when things started getting strange. And I left back to my career at Boeing in Washington State in order to provide for them the best possible means of living for them and the best possible health care, whatever I can for them, given that that was a really good career I had before. And they would remain here in Alabama in our house. And uh, after that, she started making phone calls to the police and SEMS, had these strange reports that I never got to see. Um, and even the police department thought they were very strange on what she was saying because I was not even in the state anymore. And that's where it all kind of, she ended up jumping to a self-help clinic. Uh, and she hid there for a while. And that's when the state became involved and started realizing that she was having some sort of mental issues. And this was not a stable environment for the children because she had a perfectly safe uh, house and she was not in there and I wasn't even in the state. Um, eventually I filed for emergency, uh, for emergency custody because there was something not right going on with her and, uh, the statements she was giving them were not adding up. And so that was granted to me in June. And after that was granted, Nancy, for whatever reason, decided to agree to start some counseling and try to reconcile. And she had refused any sort of counseling, mental help or anything since, since we've been together. And so that was a surprise to me. So me as a father, I'm supposed to provide a good, loving environment for them and a safe place to live. And so I would rather work on the relationship other than end it. And she took advantage of my love towards her and was able to cancel the divorce, cancel the emergency order through her persuasion through me. And I was, I was stupid and didn't see what she was doing. And she eventually took the children down to Utah, um, refused to tell me where they were at. All I know is that they were at her sister's and I had no info on where that was and she refused to tell me. I didn't have her sister's contact info. Um, and I, I hadn't seen them since the day 
They disappeared down to Utah around the end of June. I hadn't seen them at all until this last court date on the 20th of September. And that's when uh, the judge ordered me to go up to Washington and grab my RV and uh, come back down in a nesting agreement where we would alternate living in the house and the RV until we had a final permanent um, court order for our divorce. That's what stood out to me too, that interesting order from the judge that you would kind of rotate living in that RV or camper. How long did that go on? It never happened. I arrived Wednesday at 4th is when I got on my property and that never happened. That was the agreement, but I believe she mentally could not, she mentally could not comprehend that because she wanted full control of the children and no sort of, no sort of an interaction from me. And I, I, I don't know. It was, they had told us that if we did not agree to that, the children immediately to foster care because of her accusations of domestic violence and the protective order she had filed on me. Were there any domestic violence incidents in the house? Never. The only time anything ever occurred was the 17th of September, where I flew in from Pensacola and drove down here to my house to find a a white F-150 I did not recognize. And the locks were different on the house. She had changed them out. So I proceeded to the backside of the house where I had purposely left a window in case she tried to change the locks out on me. I went to the window where she immediately tried to push me out the window, clawed my arms, and told me I needed to go away. She doesn't want me around the children. And I am again. And at that point, I I got over the couch. And all I told her, I said, look, I just want to hug my children. You can call the police if you want. I said, I just want to give my son and daughter a hug. I haven't seen them for uh, almost three months at that point. And uh, so she proceeded to call them while I was giving my son a hug. And I, I picked him up and she proceeded to grab him and rip him out of my arms for, and he started crying. And, and then she grabbed me and dragged them outside to sit in the car while she waited for the police. And then I was left in the house with this guy I didn't know. and. I don't know. And then I found out there was a protective order against me that was filed in the state of Utah that I had never been served paper sort of awareness on. And I was taken into jail for 24 hours because it was in their system, even though she's the one who assaulted me and tried pushing me out. But the accusations, I never got to see anything on what she accused me of. All I know, it was 17 pages long, and she did it when she was hiding the children in Utah. So we've talked a bit about Nancy's mental state at the time of the murders and even leading up to it. You referenced it when I first sat down with you um, talking about bringing awareness to mental health. So can you give me a better sense of what was going on? What do you think was going through Nancy's mind at this time? Honestly, I, she is not during this time, she is not the same person that I married and everything I'm I am 100% started during the beginning of the pandemic. Back when QAnon started, she was calling me at work and telling me everything that was going to happen. I need to watch out for blackouts and whatever else. And that's where it all started. And then anything else that came out after that, she just absorbed as real information. And it got worse and worse and worse. And I believe her grounding in reality disappeared on what was right and what's not right and what's true and what's not true. And she didn't have, and she put it above family life is the biggest thing. She, she would not get off her phone. It was constant social media. And, uh, I, that, that's, that's in my opinion, those views, those types of situations is what led to this. And, her refusal to get any sort of counseling, help, medication, anything 
is also a reason why this happened. And I can't force her to do anything. I can't, can't call up the wagon and have and take her away to get her on her feet. Uh, that, that's, and she made a choice. She wanted zero help. You had made mention just in that previous answer about QAnon and some um, incidents over the pandemic. I mean, that was a very intense time for a lot of people. A lot of people spent more time on the internet. So with that reference to QAnon or some of the uh, rabbit holes she may have gone down, do you think that she may have been a conspiracy theorist? It wasn't that she was a conspiracy theorist. It was that she had an open mind of possibilities of different things happening. And she was always an open, and that's how everyone should be as open-minded abilities of different things that happen in the world. But the problem was she could not process um, when, let's say, some, some statement or issue came out that was very wild. She could not let that go. Even if it was proven wrong, it was just kind of taken as face fact but into her mind and she just kept going. And I think a lot of, uh, she did, she read tons of stories of cases like this or also, uh, cases of sex traffic is very taxing on the mind. And she just, I think she got too entangled in that and could not detach from that. And I think that was a really big, issue that she didn't recognize that she knocked herself away from that, having young children and having a family. And you've made a couple of notes as well about this mental health issue that she may have had, that you said she refused to receive any sort of counseling. Is that something that you were pressing for, either group or family uh, counseling or individual for her? I was trying to at least get marriage counseling and sometimes just just one-on-one -on -one counseling separate from each, just something to get her in the door. And she refused. She honestly thought they were going to prescribe her medications. And she honestly thought they were going to try to inject her with something. It was just absolutely, no matter what I did, there was an excuse why she didn't want to do it. So moving forward to last week, after this devastating news that you receive, I mean, firsthand going into the crime scene, um, officials on the scene, you know, mark it off. This has been the scene of a murder. Uh, what are the early stages of the investigation? Were you looped in on any of that? That's really interesting. So I, I had communication with the detective, but they, during the whole time, the media, everyone else found out the details happened. After, during the day when I, um, here's how it kind of went. I was, you know, taken down to their administrative building, given my, gave my statements on what I found and happened. Then I was driven to a hotel room, um, where I stayed until they released the crime scene. And I think it was foolish to leave someone in a hotel room unmonitored after they just lost three family members. I mean, that's, that's like setting someone up. I, I know I would never, ever hurt myself, but I know other people are, are not as stable as me, but at least someone check on you. I only had the church checking on me, and that's, that's the biggest thing during the times is having someone check on you and making sure okay. And as someone who works in true crime, I cover a lot of stories like this, unfortunately. And in the early stages of the investigation, often what happens is that officials look at the significant other, the spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend. Is that something that officials have done with you, question you? Do you believe that you were a suspect or person of interest in the case? I think for maybe when they showed up on scene, but... You know, like I believe the sheriff even said it. Once I gave up, you know, I said, here, take my phone. You want to see my phone? You know, I just gave whatever they wanted. And I told them everything that I could that I knew. But, but I, once they started seeing the facts and the situation and the timeline and how I matched up, they knew I wasn't a su suspect. And it is still ongoing. So they may still be investigating other things. But I don't think once they all saw the scene, they was a suspect. Are you cooperating with the investigation as it continues? And are they giving you updates? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I would, you know, I, 
I, I always cooperated with them. Um, I, I've been giving as been given uh, updates, but not much. And they have just told me it's still ongoing. There's still things that are Nancy's possessions and her phone and various clothing. She had taken a backpack or a luggage bag over to the neighbors. I believe it was Wednesday and told one of the neighbors, if anything happens to me, uh, it was my husband. And that was very strange because that was home that she shut off and I wasn't even home yet. As we're moving forward with this and new details come out, we're still kind of coming to terms with this. And I'm sure you are the scene that you found. Is there anything you want people to know about your children or your estranged wife, their memory as it lives on? This was not, not Nancy's behavior. Nancy always went above and beyond as a mother and it was incredible to watch her when we had her, had me as our first child and her to learn and grow. And she took that and Jacob, it was just, it was a great experience. Our house was always filled with joy, happiness. Our kids were always, there was no, there was very little pouting or grunting or it was just, they loved life. And, you know, I, I honestly think there's a lot of people who, Divorce prematurely truly don't put the work into their relationship and they do realize that having that stable home environment helps both the children and the parents keep it all together when you're going through rough times. Yeah. Derek, thank you again for taking the time to speak with us about something that's very tragic and I'm sure difficult for your family. So again, sorry for your loss. Thank you for having me. Now, we at Long Crime Network reached out to the Mobile County Sheriff's Office for more information about the investigation, but have not yet heard back. Reporting for Long Crime Network, I'm Sierra Gillespie.